Welcome to Steam Systems Part 3, Distribution, Control, and Regulation of Steam. This course is the third in the Steam series of courses. It is recommended that you take Steam 1 and Steam 2 before taking this course. This module was produced with the support of Spyrex Sarco. At the completion of this course, you will be able to Describe the basic steam circuit. Explain why adequate drainage is important. List the benefits of steam and condensate metering. Name the main components used in controlling and regulating steam. Explain two typical applications and two typical methods of tracing. Identify the benefits of steam and condensate manifolds. Steam is one of the oldest and most widely used forms of energy in industry. Difficulties in the energy management of steam arise from the fact that it is often a totally unmeasured service. The distribution, control, and regulation of steam is crucial because inefficiency translates into additional operating costs. This course will review the chief components of steam systems for control of pressure and temperature and system access via manifolds. We will also examine the benefits associated with measuring steam and applications of tracing. From the outset, an understanding of the basic steam circuit, steam and condensate loop is required. The steam flow in a circuit is due to the condensation of steam, which causes a pressure drop. This induces the flow of steam through the piping. The steam generated in the boiler must be conveyed through pipework to the point where its heat energy is required. Initially, there will be one or more main pipes, or steam mains which carry the steam from the boiler in the direction of the steam using equipment. Smaller branch pipes can then carry the steam to the individual pieces of equipment. When the boiler crown valve is opened, emitting the steam into the distribution piping network, there immediately begins a process of heat loss. These losses of energy are in the heating up of the piping network to the steam temperature and natural losses to the ambient air conditions. The resulting condensate falls to the bottom of the piping and is carried along with the steam flow along the steam main. This condensate must be drained from this piping or severe damage will result. When the valves serving the individual pieces of equipment call for steam, the flow into the heat exchange equipment begins again causing condensation and the resultant pressure drop, which induces even more flow. Since we have already established that steam's principal job is to give up its latent heat energy and recondense to water, we can assume that it will do so anywhere and everywhere because all heat flow is from hot to cold. When the steam is emitted into the distribution piping network, the steam immediately begins to heat the piping. This transfer of heat energy creates condensate, or if the piping is already at the same temperature as the steam, there are still losses to the ambient air conditions, even when insulated. This liquid condensate would continue to build up to the point of blocking all of the steam piping if it is not properly removed. A buildup of water can lead to water hammer capable of fracturing pipes and fittings, when carried into the steam spaces of heat exchangers, it simply adds to the thickness of the condensate film and reduces heat transfer. Inadequate drainage leads to leaking joints and is a potential cause of wire drawing of control valve seats. Wire drawing can occur when a valve is operated for extended periods close to its shutoff point. Water flow erodes or scores a pathway in the seating material. 
This erosion, or gouge, remains open when the valve is closed to its off position. Small flows and pressure creep can occur. Periodically, in a steam distribution main piping network, condensate drip stations need to be installed to remove this condensate from the system. These pockets should be designed with as much care as possible. This allows the condensate a low point in which to drop out of the steam flow and be removed by steam traps. We will learn more about this in parts 4 and 5 of this series of classes, including the energy efficiency value of recovering the condensate. As we said earlier, difficulties in the energy management of steam arise from the fact that it is often a totally unmeasured service. Metering starting in the boiler house is essential if savings are to be validated. Although fuel consumption is fairly easy to monitor, measurement of steam is a bit more difficult. A steam meter must compensate for quality as well as pressure, specific volume, and temperature. Performance of different types of meters when used on steam will vary, and the measurement may not always be accurate. Most meters depend on a measurement of volume. Since volume depends on pressure, measurements need to be taken at a constant pressure to the meter or else specific corrections have to be applied. Readings taken under fluctuating pressure conditions are inaccurate unless the meter can automatically compensate. Steam metering should be done downstream of a good quality reducing valve, which maintains a constant pressure. Readings should be interpreted using the meter factor if required to compensate for ambient conditions and the meter calibration should be checked from time to time. Steam is still the most widely used heat carrying medium in the world. It is used in the processes that make many of the foods we eat, the clothes we wear, components of the cars that we ride in, and the furniture that we use. It is used in hospitals for sterilization of instruments or surgical packs, in the refining process of crude oil based products, in chemical production, and in the laundry that cleans our clothes. Despite this, it is commonly regarded as an almost free service, easily available. Very few attempt to monitor its usage and costs, as they would for other raw materials in the process. But a steam meter won't save energy. This statement is sometimes used as a reason for not installing steam meters. It cannot be argued against if steam meters are evaluated in the same way as other pieces of energy saving equipment or schemes. A statement such as the one quoted here does little to ease the frustration of the energy manager or factory manager trying to establish where steam is being used, how much is being used, and whether it is being used wisely and effectively. All too often, when the need for a steam meter is accepted, only central monitoring, for example, in the boiler house or a major plant room, is carried out. Monitoring at branch mains or at each plant room, a section of the process or major pieces of steam using equipment are not considered. While central monitoring will establish overall steam flow figures and thus costs, Departmental monitoring will give data which is much more useful. Such steam meters will enable checks to be kept on individual plant performance. Costs can be analyzed for each part of the process and payback records can be established following the implementation of energy saving measures. The steam meter is the first basic tool in good steam housekeeping. It provides the knowledge of steam usage 
and cost, which is vital to an efficiently operated plant or building. The main reasons for using a steam meter are plant efficiency, energy efficiency, process control, costing and custody transfer. Click each of these to explore the topics further. The proper control and regulation of steam, either in regards to steam pressure for equipment or for the flow of this valuable heat energy source to heat transfer equipment is mandatory for today's industrial and HVAC steam users for efficient usage of this energy source. The control of heat flow to product temperatures in process equipment is mandatory Otherwise, production wastage becomes intolerable, which means lost profits. The control of steam pressures and the regulation of steam flow to heat exchangers is accomplished by several different types of valves. Most steam boilers are designed to work at relatively high pressures, generally above the steam pressure required in equipment, and should not be operated at lower pressures. Operation at lowered pressures causes reduced efficiencies and increased potential for boiler carryover. For this reason, the highest efficiency is maintained by generating and distributing the highest steam pressures that the boiler is capable of producing. To produce lower pressure steam at the point of use, a building pressure reducing valve should be used. This system design allows for much smaller distribution piping reducing the costs and reducing heat losses from these pipes. Also, every piece of steam using equipment has a maximum safe working pressure which cannot be exceeded in operation. Another energy efficiency reason for reducing steam pressures is the latent heat content which is greater in lower pressure steam. More heat content per pound means less pounds of steam to do the work. These are not the only reasons for reducing steam pressure. Since the temperature of saturated steam is determined by its pressure, control of pressure is a simple but effective method of accurate temperature control. This fact is used in applications such as sterilizers and control of surface temperatures on contact dryers. Reducing steam pressure will also cut down on the losses of flash steam from vented condensate return receivers. Most pressure reducing valves currently available can be divided into three groups organized by their operation direct acting control valves, pilot operated valves, pneumatically operated valves. Click each of these to explore the topics further. The direct acting valve is the simplest design. This type of valve has two main drawbacks in that it allows greater fluctuation of the downstream pressure under unstable load demands, and these valves have relatively low capacity for their size. It is nevertheless perfectly adequate for a whole range of simple applications where accurate control is not essential and where the steam flow is fairly small and reasonably constant. Where accurate control of pressure or large capacity is required, a pilot-operated reducing valve should be used. The pilot-operated design offers a number of advantages over the direct acting valve. 
Only very small changes in downstream pressure are necessary to produce large changes in flow. The result is a valve which gives close control of downstream pressure regardless of variations on the upstream sides. Pneumatically operated control valves with actuators and positioners being piloted by controllers will provide pressure reduction with even more accurate control. Industry, sophistication, and control needs are demanding closer and more accurate control of system pressures, making pneumatic control valves much more popular today. Oversizing, a common industry practice, should be avoided at all costs, regardless of the type of control valve selected. A valve that is too large in capacity capabilities will tend to be eroded and almost always allow more or less flow through the valve than was actually needed, causing larger pressure fluctuations downstream. A smaller, correctly sized reducing valve will be less prone to wear and will give more accurate control. Where it is necessary to make bigger reductions in pressure or to cope with wide fluctuations in loads, it is recommended to use two or more valves in series or parallel to improve controllability and the life expectancy of the valves. Although reliability and accuracy depend on correct selection and sizing, they also depend on correct installation. Since the majority of reducing valve problems are caused by the presence of wet steam and or dirt, a steam separator and strainer with a fine mesh screen is fitted before the valve. As part of a preventative maintenance program, all strainers should be installed with blow-down valves for regular dirt removal. If the downstream equipment is not capable of withstanding the full upstream steam pressure, then a safety relief valve must be fitted either on the downstream piping or the specific piece of equipment to be protected from overpressurization in case of valve failure. This safety relief valve must be sized to handle the maximum steam flow of the reducing valve at the desired set relief pressure. Most types of steam equipment need to utilize some form of temperature control system. In process equipment, product quality is often dependent upon accurate temperature control while heating systems need to be thermostatically controlled in order to maintain optimum comfort conditions. From an energy savings and quality point of view, controlling the steam energy supply to a process piece of equipment to maintain the desired product temperature, whether air or any product, is mandatory. If process systems are not controlled to the desired temperatures, then the system will run wild, either not providing the required heat energy or overheating the product to unacceptable levels. Temperature control can be accomplished by several methods and valves. Manual control valves, self-acting control valves, pilot-operated control valves, and pneumatic control valves. Click each of these to explore the top. Manual valves can be applied to a piece of equipment to control the energy supplied to the process as simply as they are used to regulate the flow of other fluids. The major drawback of manual valves to control temperatures is that these valves will undoubtedly need frequent adjustments and monitoring to maintain just the correct temperatures under constantly changing load conditions, which is the case of most pieces of process equipment. Self-acting control valves are operated by a sensor system that senses the product temperatures. They can be set 
to any temperature between the upper and lower limits by means of an adjustment knob. Pilot-operated temperature control valves control a small pilot device, which in turn operates the main valve for throttling the steam flow. The sensing system is much smaller in physical size. These systems tend to control the required temperatures much closer to the desired levels, and if and when a load change requirement occurs, the pilot-operated valves are able to respond to these changes much more rapidly. Pneumatic control valves rely on control signals from an external sensing system, converting this temperature signal into either a compressed air signal to actuate the valve or from a temperature signal to an electrical signal. Sensitivity and response time to changes of load condition are enhanced with this type of valve system. Another benefit of using this arrangement of control system is the ability to observe the valve's opening position externally by either an indicator on the valve stem or by the compressed air signal applied to the actuator. The deciding factors for the selection of the proper control valve system for a specific application is certainly the degree of accuracy required on the product's temperature and the response time to load changes if there are any. We have looked at how steam is distributed through a typical system. Another interesting use of steam is tracing. There are two typical applications of tracing. They are typically referred to as either process fluid, critical, or freeze protection, non-critical tracing. There are different requirements for each as far as heat is concerned, so we will separate their requirements prior to discussing how to attach tracing to the application. Tracing is, as its name implies, a pipe or tube following either process fluid lines or lines where it is desirable to prevent freezing during the winter months. Steam tracing is the distribution of steam through small bore tubing or pipes, which basically transfer heat to a larger pipe to keep the fluids from becoming viscous, solidifying, or freezing. Typically, Process fluids are already at as high a temperature as desired. They have passed through heat exchange equipment and absorbed as much heat as necessary to keep the viscosity to a level that they flow smoothly through the piping. Tracing is installed running along the fluid lines mainly to keep the product at the specific temperature it already has. It is, therefore, a heat maintainer and not a heat exchanger. Because of this, the consumption of the steam is usually very low. In fact, it is one of the smallest steam consumers in a given plant. The fact is, however, that in some plants, they account for as much as 70% of the steam using locations. The fact that they consume very little steam is then overshadowed by the sheer number of lines. In areas where freezing conditions prevail during the winter months, many different types of systems require protection from freeze-up. Usually, these lines are water lines or perhaps metering equipment that use water in sensor tubes to detect flow of gases. Tracing lines keep the water from freezing, which will in turn possibly rupture piping, tubing, or equipment. Sometimes, liquids that will not necessarily freeze become very thick if not heated and kept heated throughout their processing. This type of protection is described as non-critical because it is not crucial to the main process of the plant.
If those pipes burst, it would certainly be inconvenient, but perhaps not a critical problem that would prevent production. If the pipe contents were vital for production, this would be classified as critical tracing. There are many different ways of attaching tracing, and there are many different types or methods of using the tracing concept. Typically, tracing is copper tubing attached to a pipe filled with some type of fluid. Another popular method of tracing is the use of jacketed pipe. This method of tracing is used particularly when there is a need to keep a fluid, such as sulfur, from solidifying in the pipes. The easiest method of tracing is by attaching copper tubing to the pipe. It is used mostly because of the abundance of copper tubing and the cost, which is relatively low. The tubing is attached in the lower quadrant of the pipe being traced. Another important consideration in tracing is to oppose the two flows, fluids in the process piping and steam in the tracer tubes. This may not always be practiced, but there are some solid reasons why you would want to consider doing this. Think about what the tracer job is. Maintain heat already absorbed by the process fluid. As it transfers from point A to point B in the plant, heat will naturally be lost through the insulation. The job of the tracer then is to allow transfer of the heat of the steam into the flowing fluids as it is lost to the atmosphere. The tracer line then should also be installed running in a straight line as far toward the bottom of the piping as possible. The tracer is housed inside the insulation wrapping on the pipe and we gain much benefit from attaching it in this manner. Heat, which you may recall, rises naturally and surrounds the piping, allowing for as much natural conduction of joules or BTUs as possible. This heat barrier also reduces the heat losses from the process fluids. On some occasions, the amount of heat available and temperature of the steam is such that spacers are used to prevent burning the liquids on the inside of the process lines. This could cause coking of the lines and also restrict flow of the process. When spacers are used, it is important that the insulation be sized to allow for the extra space required. It may also be advisable to label the outside of the insulation with information such as traced and maybe even the number of tracer lines attached along with the pressures being used. This may help in future maintenance of the system. There may be times when the number of tracer lines being used can be reduced. For example, a process pipe during the winter months may require multiple tracer lines to ensure that the fluids remain at the proper temperature. However, during the summer months, the numbers of tracer lines may be reduced because of less heat loss through the insulation. Some plants list the steam manifold header number where the on-off valves may be found to help with reducing the amount of steam being consumed unnecessarily. Jacketed pipe may be an alternative method of tracing when the process fluids require a high temperature to stay flowing with the least amount of resistance. These liquid lines are usually fluids that set up at very high temperatures such as sulfur. They are very specialized tracer lines as the steam jacket completely encircles the process fluid line. This pipe within a pipe requires special attention and will require specialized traps to ensure proper drainage. Jacketed pipe obviously transfers a lot of heat in comparison to steam tracer lines made of copper or stainless steel. 
This type of tracer line usually is used when the temperature of the process fluid is about the same temperature as the steam being used. The lines are usually flange fitted and the passing of steam from one line to the next requires steam flow to ensure the passage of steam on down the lines. Each jacketed line has a connection at the bottom of the downstream line that is used to drain each section individually. This is important because this particular type of specialized tracer is truly acting like a heat exchanger. The steam consumption of this type of tracing may be much higher than the smaller tubing type tracers used in plants. Steam manifolds are most helpful in running the steam to the system. Manifolds are easily maintained and located as opposed to individually valving areas of a plant. A centralized location for manifolds ensures operators of turning on and off the correct valves for tracing. Manifolds should be fitted with a tag that identifies what lines are traced and how many lines are going to that particular process line. Other considerations for manifolding steam lines is the ability to control automatic valves on and off. If the tracing on a particular manifold is used for freeze protection, ambient sensors on control valves will automatically turn the steam on when needed. This ensures that the steam is turned on and off properly. The important word here is off. It is not unusual to see steam lines turned on during a particular time of year. The conditions may change at any given time and the steam may not be required. If the steam is always on, then it is always used even in small quantities. This is wasteful and should be avoided. As this course has mentioned, it is important to conserve this precious and costly commodity called steam. Even though tracing systems individually use small amounts of steam, remember the sheer numbers of lines that may be involved. Condensate manifolds are also very useful in any typical plant that uses tracing. The condensate manifold itself locates traps and tracers in a small given area. The condensate from the tracer lines is usually very high quality condensate and should be collected and returned to the boiler. There is normally no cross-contamination of product fluid lines to tracer lines. Condensate manifolds also make it very easy to find and monitor the tracing traps being used. Each trap station on a manifold should be tagged with a number that identifies the trap, size, and pressure so that a maintenance program can help determine the correctness of either the traps being selected or the size of the trap being used. These manifolds can be either horizontally or vertically designed depending on the space available and the specification of any given plant. We will learn more about condensate in the other classes in the STEAM series. Let's take a moment to review what we've covered throughout this course. The basic STEAM circuit is a STEAM and condensate loop where the steam's job is to give up its latent heat energy and recondense to water. It is important to remove any condensate that forms within the steam pipes. The benefits of measuring steam include improvements in the plant efficiency, energy efficiency, process control, and costing and custody transfer. Controlling and regulating steam is necessary to avoid waste and provide steam of the correct pressure and temperature. This can be done through pressure reducing valves, direct acting control valves, pilot operated valves, and pneumatically operated valves, and temperature control valves, manual control valves, self acting control valves, pilot operated control valves, and pneumatic control valves. Two typical applications of tracing include process critical tracing and freeze protection non-critical tracing. Two typical methods of tracing 
are copper tubing and jacketed pipe. Steam manifolds are most helpful